so Mike Parisio currently serves as a forest entomologist for the Maine Forest Service and the Insect Disease and Disease Lab in Augusta, Maine. His major areas of focus include spruce budworm population monitoring, regulatory oversight of emerald ash borer and other quarantine forest pests, as well as various other trapping programs for the detection of invasive bark beetles and wood borers. Prior to working for the Maine Forest Service, he served as a forest health specialist for both the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. He grew up in the beautiful Catskill Mountains of New York, and he earned his Master of Science degree in forest entomology from the State of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry, also known as SUNY ESF, where his graduate research focused on the biological control of the invasive emerald ash borer. So welcome, Mike, and we're really looking forward to your presentation tonight. All right, thanks, Terry. Don't I sound prestigious on paper, but um, nice to meet you <laughs> all. Um, I wish we could, uh, yeah, do this in person. Hopefully soon we'll be able to. Um, yeah, Terry, I see there's only 18 people right now, so uh, depending on what you want to do, if it stays that few, if, if folks do want to uh, interrupt uh, during the presentation, uh, if we have that few people, I'm actually okay with that, but I'll, I'll leave that up to you. But um, otherwise, okay. I will jump right into it. And uh, yeah, I'm going to turn my video off, and hopefully you still got my screen. Yes, we do. All right, great. Here we go. Okay, so before I talk about some of our, our big pests of concern right now, I will just give you a little background about the Insect and Disease Lab, who we are and what we do. So uh, we were founded in 1921 and our mission statement is to protect the forest, shade and ornamental tree resources of the state from significant insect and disease damage and to provide pest management and damage prevention for homeowners, municipalities, forest landowners and managers thereby preserving the overall health of Maine's forest resources. So that's what we're out there to do. That's a tall order these days, but uh, we, we do what we can with, with what we have to work with. So uh, yeah, as you're all aware, there's there's a lot going on in the uh, the forest health world right now in, in Maine and, and pretty much everywhere. But um, some of the core things that we do, so we provide pest diagnosis, um, you know, and depending on what it is, if, if that's necessary, we'll also provide management and damage prevention information uh, to whoever's seeking it. You know, we do a lot of work with homeowners, but uh, depending on the past, certainly we work a lot with, you know, municipalities where urban trees are affected, like with emerald ash borer, uh, for example, and then also uh, larger forest landowners and managers. And so, uh, fortunately, I don't know everybody's background in the, the meeting here today, but hopefully there'll be a little bit of something uh, here for all of you. So, uh, we also do a lot of monitoring, so we maintain a statewide uh, monitoring system for, for many forest insects. Um, and, you know, Aaron will talk about some of the pathology things he monitors later as well. But uh, and now that also includes a lot of abiotic things. The weather's uh, obviously having a large effect on a lot of the uh, the insect and disease issues that we deal with as a compounding, uh, compounding factor there. Um, we try to keep the public and everyone else updated. So we report regularly on uh, current events, uh, much like what I'll do in this presentation here, but uh, we prevent through all sorts of, uh, of media. Um, we do publish a, um, you know, in the summer and the, the field season, a monthly field uh, forest health conditions report. So um, you can sign up for that. That's a great way to keep abreast of what's going on, as well as some, you know, larger annual reports for our, our state report and then some federal reports that we uh, contribute to. And then last but not least, uh, we, we also oversee certain forestry related uh, quarantine regulations uh, with the overall goal of preventing, you know, additional or undue spread of pests. So those are our core um, things, you know, that, that we can do for you. Um, obviously, it's, it's a mixed bag and we do quite a bit uh, beyond that as well sometimes. Um, here's who we are. So, uh, you know, we share our division as forest health and monitoring. So on the forest health side is is entomology and pathology. So we have our state entomologist, Allison Canody out of out of Old Town. And then uh, poor Aaron's all by himself on the pathology side there, but you'll hear from him later. And then we have three entomologists um, in the, uh, the entomology lab here in Augusta as well. And then uh, underneath us, we also have a, a number of great field technicians uh, that work all over the state. And, uh, you know, they're not necessarily um, 
focused on those things. They do everything, but we're uh, we, we're assigned to them. So uh, yeah, that's our that's our little family. And sometimes we have interns as well. But um, you know, hopefully we'll get to, to meet some of you at some point, or you'll meet us. So um, one of the you know most important things for landowners to uh, to know is how to report things that are going on. So. Uh, um, you know, there's a variety of resources available in Maine. Um, you know, we try to focus primarily on, you know, uh, strictly forest pests. Uh, you know, Humane Cooperative Extension, you know, does quite a bit of other agricultural pests or household uh, pests. And, you know, CDC handles things like, you know, ticks that's on everybody's mind and stuff like that as well. But um, we do a little bit of it all. But um, if you have a forest pest issue, um, you know, this is where you'll, you'll want to start. So we have this online submission form and uh, that's available on our website i just took a little screenshot there but you can find that um and then yeah you can always reach out you know by phone um or by email so we have a, a new domain there you know forest at maine.gov you can also you know reach out to that but basically you know that's that's where you'll start you know you'll report whatever's going on to us and then uh Depending on what it is, you know, we'll have somebody funnel it to uh, the right person. You know, we uh, we all dabble in everything, but we all also have our you know core programs that we're the uh, the leads on, so to speak. And then, uh, yeah, a lot of the times, you know, it might be something simple uh, that you just haven't seen before that that we know about, and uh, you know, we can figure it out. But we love a good mystery as well, and you know, sometimes we do need to to get out there. So it's nice that we're able to you know more easily do site visits with people when needed and. Uh, you know, get to the bottom of what's going on and make some recommendations. And then, like I mentioned before, you know, a lot of the stuff uh, we're dealing with comes in, in you know, fits and spurts. You know, uh, I'll talk about brown tail moth. It's brown tail moth season right now. But um, checking out some of those, you know, uh, conditions reports that we put out there is a great resource, you know, that can uh, sometimes, you know, get ahead of the issue and, and you'll know what you're, uh, you're dealing with before you, you even have to bother to, to pick up the phone and give us a call. So that's a little bit about us. And then, uh, yeah, I'll get into some of the core pests. Uh, there's obviously, yeah, many, many more than I'll talk about um, in this presentation. And yeah, I'm curious to see if anybody's, you know, seeing any other interesting things right now. But uh, yeah, we'll get started with emerald ash borer. And I'll start with the life cycle um, of the insect. And, uh, you know, I'll start with where we are right now. So we're very fast approaching you know, the what's called the regulatory, well, we're in the regulatory flight season, but, you know, adult emergence is, is about to happen. You know, it could already be happening in southern Maine and progressing northward. So uh, right about this time is when the adult beetles are actively emerging from infested trees and the like. So uh, characteristic of um, emerald ash borer uh, versus other um, insects that attack ash, there's, there's quite a few uh, native insects you know, this D-shaped exit hole, you know, very um, conspicuous that it has a flat edge on it. So that's one of the signs we tell people to uh, look for, not commonly encountered, but something you might see. But um, yeah, once these adults emerge, they'll they'll basically spend a few weeks doing maturation, feeding and mating um, in the canopies of ash trees. And then uh, once they're done mating, the females will uh, will lay their eggs for the season. And um, yeah, the females can can lay quite a few. The average one lays about 40 to 70 um, at a time there. And yeah, they don't all lay them in, in one location. Usually it's just ones or twos and they really scatter them all around. So uh, one clutch of, uh, of eggs there is really able to do damage over a greater, uh, greater area than you'd expect. So uh, once these um, small larvae hatch, they tunnel into, you know, through the bark to the, uh, to the phloem layer, you know, the, the nutritious tissue right below the bark there between the wood and the bark. And, and that's where they spend the majority of their life cycle. And we'll take a look at what that looks like. But, um, you know, this is why this insect is such a problem. Most of the life cycle, you know, is so inconspicuous. Those eggs are, you know, a millimeter long at best. And then, uh, you know, the majority of the life cycle takes place underneath the bark there. So, that's one reason that this insect moves in, you know, infested wood as much as it does because nobody knows it's in there. Um, and then the adults, you know, just happen to emerge in the in the wrong place once they've been transported somewhere inadvertently. So let's take a look at what this actually looks like. So things that you know landowners should always be aware of, and uh, you know, especially dependent on your location is what to look for for emerald ash borer. Most of the time, it's not the insect itself that's going to be the giveaway. 
It's woodpeckers. That's our, our latest, uh, you know, and greatest friend as far as detection is concerned. So um, once you have an established population of EAB in an area, you know, it'll build over several years. It's usually there for, on average, you know, minimum two, three years before anybody has any idea. Uh, but once you hit that point and the population is built up a little bit, the, the woodpeckers will they'll pick up on it, you know, before we do. And so this is what their feeding looks like. And it can be very dramatic. We call this, you know, woodpecker flecking or blonding because of that light colored uh, inner bark that's exposed. But, um, you know, this stands out like a sore thumb in the woods. So, you know, the woodpeckers will just cruise the stems of these trees, knocking off bits of bark, you know, as they test it and stuff. And this is what successful feeding looks like. So there's a couple other things that will cause this uh, smooth bark uh, disease um, causes these patches. It doesn't have that same coloration. Branch rubs can sometimes cause stuff like that. Even squirrels occasionally will do some bizarre things where they, you know, uh, disfigure the bark and stuff like that. But I mean, this is really classic here. So you can see, you know, this woodpecker maybe working. Can you guys see my pointer? Yeah. Oh, yep, I can see it. Okay. So yeah. So as they're moving, you know, this is an unsuccessful test, test, test. But when you have these flex here, and they're paired with those uh, holes where the larvae have actually been removed. You know, that's how, you know, kind of a, a dead giveaway that you've got EAB in that tree. So here's another example, you know, you have the, the bark removed and it knows it's under there, it's removed it, and there's a third one there. So, so this is what we're really, you know, looking for as far as detecting new populations and spread um, in addition to some other stuff, but this is pretty effective. And winter is obviously the best time to do this when the leaves are off. So, so make sure you're familiar with this. And if you see something like this, you know, we, we do want to know about it. And then if we take that bark away, you know, here's what the, the damaging agent, which is the larvae looks like. So here's a penny for scale, even at the very first instar early stages, um, EAB larvae begin to feed in a serpentine or S-shaped pattern. So you can see it already has begun that winding back and forth, back and forth. So, you know, here's on a larger scale. This is a complete gallery uh, throughout the entire lifespan of the larvae there. So back and forth, back and forth and a little variation, but still overall, you know, kind of has that that S-shaped pattern. So, um, yeah, you might see some uh, some other insect galleries in ash, um, but nothing's really going to look quite like this. Uh, some things can look similar, but those are the kind of things you always want to call in and check with us. And uh, I've looked at these for for so many years now. I've got a pretty good knack for it. But uh, yeah, once you get the eye for it, you'll you'll know pretty much right away. And so, you know, here's another example. Um, you know, obviously a lot of woodpecker activity. You know, you remove a chunk of bark. Here's that gallery back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then this is actually, you know, an emergence hole here from an adult that successfully emerged. Um, so overlying, uh, you know, if that bark was still there, you'd have that classic D-shaped exit hole. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty classic. Um, again, you know, winter is a good time to look for that. And yeah, as the populations build, you know, it starts to, uh, it starts to look more and more like this. So the bark just flipped open here. But you can see again, you know, S shapes and, and again, it's variable, but, you know, overall you got these winding galleries, you know, S shaped. So, so if you're dealing with ash and you see something like that, you should definitely be concerned. And this is how it works. I mean, if you didn't know about the woodpeckering, you, you wouldn't really know what's going on underneath this tree, but obviously that woodpeckering is a dead giveaway, but take this bark away. And this is, this is the damaging, you know, this is how this damage happens. So you basically consume all the flowing material in the tree until it's uh, no longer able to uh, to transport any nutrients um, and it basically you know is, is girdled or, or starved to death here so this is you know a very extreme example um, of a tree I was I was working with it doesn't take this much at all you know these trees can die with with much uh, many fewer galleries than you see here this is just an absolutely remarkable tree but this is not in Maine so uh, I haven't seen anything like this yet up here, but uh, unfortunately, we we might be headed there. So, um, yeah, one of the important things to note about EAB, it is one of the uh, insects that is currently regulated here in the state. So there are two core regulated areas. Uh, basically, there was an infestation across the river in Canada that spilled over, uh, began in Madawaska. And so, you know, these are our detections up there, these, these dark red um, spots here. 
uh, buffered by a 10 mile area. So um, the way these maps work, you know, this potential expansion area of 10 miles, that orange zone, you know, EAB might be hard to find, but you couldn't say whether it's, you know, probably there or not, but you could, you could reasonably expect that that area is considered generally infested, infested. So, and then here's where the real problem is, you know, this is, this is progressing, but, you know, much slower than, than things in the South here. So, uh, this map gets updated pretty frequently, unfortunately, uh, as well as the quarantine boundaries. But uh, for the time being, yeah, all of York County, all of Cumberland, these five southernmost towns in Oxford are regulated areas. So, so what that means is for any ash products, you know, they cannot leave this boundary uh, without proper permitting. Um, and you know, it always depends on the case. We don't issue permits for everything, um, but but some stuff is allowed. You know, at certain times of year when the, when the insect is not active and it also depends on the product. So, so yeah, just know, you know, this is why, you know, we're preaching, you know, about don't move firewood. If you live in this area and you're going camping, you know, up north, you know, you're not permitted to bring hardwood firewood out of this zone or any ash products. So, um, yeah, just, just be aware of those things. Not everybody is, um, even though these have been in place for, for several years now. Uh, and so the other thing to know, you might hear about, you know, that the insect was federally regulated. So here's what the national map looks like. And, you know, the story began in 2002 back in Michigan. And unfortunately, I think it's 36 states, you know, including Maine now that are that are infested and uh, or have a population at all. And, you know, five Canadian provinces. So uh, from a federal regulation standpoint, EAB has pretty much run its course and populated, you know, the, the native range of our, our ashes in eastern North America. So they didn't seem like uh, that the effort uh, to regulate this was needed anymore. So they removed those things. But here in Maine, again, you know, we have a very different situation where the last, you know, state in the northeast and, and most of the range of ash to become infested. And, you know, we still have a lot of, of area to protect. So uh, we've basically adopted uh, our own laws that are now in place that take the place of of all those federal laws that previously protected us. So, again, you know that means nothing leaving, no ash products leaving. Um, you know these regulated areas, in addition to you know no ash products <clears throat> being allowed in from out of state. In addition to that hardwood firewood and that hardwood firewood ban has has also been in place for for several years. All right, so what's the point of all that regulation? What are we trying to protect in Maine? So as you can see on that map, you know, we have these two small regulated areas where we know we have large populations of emerald ash borer, but then we also have this central area. And this is basically what we're trying to protect here. So, you know, we have some 481 uh, million ash trees over one inch DBH. That's about 2% of all the trees in Maine. And so, um, of the ash themselves, though, within these regulated areas, we're only talking about 6% of, uh, of the ash trees in Maine. So that means that still well over 90% uh, of the ash are non-infested at this point, and they're in areas where EAB is not known to occur. So, you know, this whole regulated area or, you know, this whole, the green is the, the ash um, range in Maine where there, you know, are higher concentrations. It occurs elsewhere, but this is really the, the core area that <clears throat> we're trying to protect. So. So yeah, that's the point of all these regulations. And, uh, hopefully, we'll keep EAB out of those areas for as long as possible and prevent uh, just a lot of damage in that area. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in addition to those regulations, we do a ton of uh, detection work for for EAB and other things. But um, one of our big programs is called the Girdle Trap Tree Program. So this is something that landowners can can happily get involved in, and we're usually always looking for uh, for volunteers, uh, depending on where you're located, uh, for new detections and stuff like that. But but basically, uh, what you do is is you go out in the early spring and you remove a, a chunk of uh, bark from around the uh, the trunk of a tree, and you basically simulate um, you know girdling uh, that you would incur like through EAB. And so uh, when the tree experiences that stress, it, it starts to produce some certain chemicals um, that are emitted that, you know, EAB can actually detect. And so these trees become pretty much more attractive to, uh, to females looking for, uh, for <clears throat> places to deposit their eggs. And so they can serve as sort of a sink. So um, you'll girdle that tree, allow it to be exposed to EAB potentially over the uh, 
the course of the summer months. And then you'll go back in the fall and you basically peel all the bark off to look for larvae and, and destructively sample it. So this is how we've had quite a bit of success with detecting uh, EAB spread in Maine. <clears throat> so yeah, for example, in the northern regulated zone, like I showed you there, so Frenchville and two locations in Grand Island and Van Buren, um, you know, last year those uh, were used to detect emerald ash borer. And, you know, that was the first detection in the town of Van Buren. So showing that, you know, what an important detection tool that is. And then again, in the southern zone, multiple positive girdle trap trees in 2020 uh, in the towns of Gorham, uh, Portland, and South Bor Berwick. And then again, you know, Gorham, Gorham yeah. having a girdle trap tree be its first, um, you know, means of detection. So if you are interested, um, in participating in that tro uh, program, if you have ash on your woodlot and you'd like to participate, you can uh, get on our website and uh, fill out a form and we will reach out to you if you are a good candidate based again on, on mostly location, where we're looking and uh, where we're hoping to, uh, to detect the AB. Okay, otherwise, other for detections in 2020. So we also uh, maintain a network of purple prism traps. These are going up right now. So you may have already seen these hanging in the trees for the year, but uh, we do about 200 a year. So 2020, we had 199 out there. You can see their distribution uh, all throughout the state. Again, those are in non-regulated areas since we know EAB is probably in the regulated areas. And uh, yeah, fortunately, no EAB were detected that way. So again, with a lot of those in that central area uh, of Maine that we're trying to protect. <clears throat> Another method we use is biosurveillance. So there's actually predatory wasps uh, that are ground nesting that hunt uh, emerald ash borer and other closely related beetles. So you can actually monitor what they're bringing back to their nests to uh, provision their young with. Um, and so that's the first time it's been used elsewhere to, to detect EAB for the first time. But in Maine, that was the first time uh, we've had a positive detection using that method. So we do monitor those colonies of ground nesting wasps year after year. So that's that's really neat. And then probably most importantly, you know, we've we've uh, we've had successful reports by landowners. So this is, you know, not what we want, but we do want landowners to, you know, recognize EAB. And, and to begin to, uh, you know, successfully report it uh, and accurately, you know, uh, a lot of people have been concerned. So we've had a lot of, um, you know, false, uh, false IDs. You know, there's a lot of things that can be confused with. But uh, yeah, for the first time in, in 2020, you know, we had these, you know, positive uh, landowner IDs coming in. So um, we hope to get more of those, um, not because we hope EAB will spread other places, but, you know, just so we know about it as soon as possible. And then again, just during, you know, the course of our everyday work, you know, this tree pictured on the right here is in Waterboro, and that was actually just, uh, you know, detected in, in passing, you know, uh, on the side of the road. So. All right, and then what are we doing for management efforts? So on the forest landscape scale, there, there's not much to do, uh, but we are investing in, in uh, classical biological control. So this is basically the the release of parasitoid wasps that specialize um, on EAB larvae that uh, occur in the native range of EAB. So, you know, we've brought them uh, to North America from the native range of emerald ash borer in uh, northeastern China, uh, put them through a lot of testing to make sure they are specific to emerald ash borer. And uh, a couple of them have been approved because that's all they they tend to uh, to target. So. Uh, in the northern uh, regulated area, uh, releases have been going on since 2019. Um, two species have been, actually three species were released up there the first year, um, and last year two species were supplementarily uh, released up there as well. Um, we're not going to be releasing up there again this year, uh, but we will be monitoring to see if those uh, parasitoid populations have become established now. And, and once they're established, the idea is you know, this is long-term population reduction. It's not a cure for EAB. It'll never eliminate it, but um, we can get some relief if those become established. And then started last year in the southern zone, uh, releasing down there, and we'll continue to do so with all three species again here in 2021. And these are just really cool. So I'll just show you some pictures quick, but this is a obvious agrilli. So this is the one egg parasitoid. 
So as I mentioned before, um, emerald ash borer eggs are, you know, just about a millimeter slightly under. So you can imagine how tiny this wasp is. There you can see on the left, this is a female with her ovipositor, you know, depositing her own egg into an emerald ash borer egg. And here um, on the right, you can actually see, you know, this is the outline of a healthy emerald ash borer larva in here. Uh, same here, but there's the little wasps that have actually, you know, uh, parasitize those larvae and consume them. And once they're done with their development, they will uh, emerge and, and hunt for new um, for new eggs as well to parasitize. And then this is the Trasticus planipanesi. So this is one of the larval parasitoids. Uh, again, you know, it's just amazing. You know, these tiny wasps are able to detect emerald ash borer larvae beneath the bark of an ash tree. So, you know, this one here is located, that's the ovipositor that's actually used to drill through the bark of the tree and you know detect that larvae and deposit her eggs so this is an emerald ash borer gallery where you should see a mature larva but instead you see all of these uh, parasitoid wasp larvae where they've attacked and consumed it so same thing here there's that s-shaped gallery and that's where the larvae was found uh, by the wasp when it was parasitized and they have totally consumed it and then this is spathius so there's uh, two species that are being used. Uh, we're using one of them in Maine that's matched for our northern climate, but same thing. So these larvae develop on the outside. So you can actually see there's still the emerald ash borer larva there, uh, you know, being consumed uh, by these wasp larvae that are attached to the outside of it. So really fascinating stuff. And uh, yeah, hopefully, you know, it'll it'll become established here in Maine. There's been good success with it other places. So so as a landowner, what do you need to know about EAB and what should you do? Um, you know, here's a few, you know, just simple tips and it's obviously more complicated than this. But, uh, you know, first and foremost, you know, especially to new landowners, you know, know what you have for an ash resource. Um, you know, that's that's obviously, you know, always the best starting place. And then, you know, pay attention to those maps that are showing where EAB is and know how close you are to those, you know, and how much time you have for management. So. Um, you know, if you do have a significant ash component in your forest, you know, there's no nothing to say you can't set up a management plan that addresses, you know, that ash resource sooner rather than later, because uh, that's that's how things go. Everybody's busy. And, you know, a lot of times we don't start to uh, address the problems until they're, they're well on their way. So, um, yeah, you know, if you have that plan and you're ready to go, if you have any interest in you know, marketing any of the, the trees on your lot there, you know, you can allow them to, to grow and accumulate some more volume, you know, and uh, obviously value with that uh, before cutting them down too, uh, too soon. Um, yeah, and then, you know, if EAB is closing in and, you know, that's, that's a common thing we tell people, you know, if you're already going to have an entry for, for harvest into the stand, you know, it might be wise to, to target some ash. Uh, while you're doing that as well. So you don't have to go back in there and, and you know, double your cost for a second entry. Um, again, you know, we're always looking for uh, for help uh, in monitoring. So especially that girdle trap tree program, but, you know, public reports, you know, the more eyes we have out there looking for emerald ash borer, uh, the more we know about it. So, you know, that helps us know, you know, what, what to do at the right time. And then I put these video links in here. I don't think I'll have time for these, but I'll, I'll send those to Terry and she can share them with you later. So, so that's a lot on EAB. So we'll move to brown tail moth, which is probably on everybody's minds, depending on, on where you're living. But um, yeah, unfortunately, it's not a, not a very cheerful story here. So brown tail has indeed continued its range expansion in Maine here in 2021, as it did last year in 2020. Uh, and one of the driving factors for that is, has been climate or weather. Um, uh, what we really need, and we haven't had the past two years, are you know springs that are kind of cool, damp, and moist. And the reason for that is some of the fungal pathogens and diseases that uh, affect brown tail moth that can really exert some population control. You know they need that moisture for reproduction, especially you know spores of, of fungal pathogens. So, um, so yeah, that's what we've uh, we've been lacking, and, and we're paying the price. So. Here's just a couple of examples, you know, of brown tail moths that are actually affected by, you know, either, you know, that fungal pathogen or possibly disease. So, you know, hanging upside down, you know, disheveled, uh, still attached on one end, you know, you can obviously tell that's that's sick and dead. And so uh, we want to know about that too. If people do see big numbers of dead, uh, 
dead brown tails that, that look like that, you know, we can potentially move some of this disease around artificially um, by, you know, introducing these dead caterpillars into to big populations. So we've we've tried to tinker with that, but uh, yeah, the disease is just not as as present as you'd you'd hope. So. And there's just a couple of examples of some some winter webs, but I'm sure you've all probably seen those. So so here's what you know aerial survey results look like for brown tail moss. So uh, in addition to our statewide aerial survey, you know that covers all these flight lines shown here in blue. Uh, we do target some specific brown tail flights. So yeah, obviously uh, just a ton of acres. So there's two periods of of damage that we see these lighter colored polygons. You know that's what we'd be seeing now, and we're actually out surveying for now. So this is this is the defoliation by the mature caterpillars. I'm sure there's some folks on the line that have oak trees that are 100% uh, defoliated. So you know that's what we're seeing now. And then after the uh, the moths pupate and the adults emerge and mate, um, the early instar caterpillars will be out later in. Uh, late summer there and they do just a bit of feeding so they just call what's called skeletonizing um you know and cause some discoloration of those leaves without actually consuming them so you know those are these brown areas um so that's you know where we saw all that damage uh last year so obviously centered in in you know this part of maine and you know really the mid coast but uh yeah um again as people are probably well aware so we we don't have a risk map for this year but these are ones we've produced for uh, for the last couple. So uh, as you can see, again, those mid coast areas have been the absolute hardest hit in core areas. Uh, this year, things have shifted inland a little bit. Um, probably, you know, areas like China, Vassalboro, Unity are a really hard hit, but uh, they're also kind of included in in these these areas. But uh, as you can see, yeah, it's just uh, unfortunately looks like a problem that's here to stay right now. But you know, you can notice. I did quite a bit of surveying in, in some of these uh, extended areas here we're picking up you know really low populations of brown tail um and then yeah take a look at this map so this is we actually drive around and, and look at those winter webs and count those so as you can see these these really dark colored dots here you know in waldo and knox county and you know portions of kennebec and lincoln you know that's really where the population is so that's that's no surprise if you live there but uh you know, we're getting a lot of expansion. So I, I circled these three areas here, you know, first detections of uh, brown tail in Aristic County and in pretty much forever, you know, since it was introduced a century or so ago. Um, but yeah, you can see, you know, really it's it's starting to expand, certainly populations existing down east. I believe they they found it in, uh, in Nova Scotia as well, you know, possibly that blew across uh, the Gulf from, from Maine. But um, yeah, certainly, you know, tightening its grip on, on the main coast and, you know, this inland spread as well is, is pretty troubling. So um, as far as air life cycle, um, yeah, unfortunately, we get a lot of calls right now asking about management and and right now it's pretty much too late. The caterpillars are have done the bulk of their damage and uh, they're mature and they're they're not as susceptible to the pesticides as you would hope. So uh, as far as, as stuff to do right now, the name of the game is is pest protection or uh, personal protection and to reduce your risk of exposure. Um, but yeah, you know, earlier in the um, in the spring, you know, when the larvae are small and just beginning to uh, to feed when, when they're also unnoticeable, that's really the time to treat. So there are some insecticide options. So if folks are interested in that, I, I really advise you get on the website and do some, some reading on that. And we also maintain a list of pesticide applicators that will do that sort of treatment. So, so like I said, we're kind of beyond that. We'll be getting, you know, this is the highest risk of exposure. So I was scratching earlier on the webcam. I saw I've got the rash right now myself but um yeah hopefully you know we're almost going to be out of that in a couple weeks here uh the adults will be flying um like i said they'll reproduce lay their eggs and those larvae will do that uh that um early se or late season skeletonizing and so those were those dark brown areas on that map so again those those might be next year's problem so pay attention to that survey map too but uh Pretty much wherever you are, you can you can be guaranteed you're going to have some uh, population of brown tail. And then a great thing to do in the winter 
if you're able uh, as well they're in their winter webs there um, after they become dormant for the winter is whatever you can reach to go out and physically clip those out before they emerge in mid-April and again that's the time to start thinking you know about uh, insecticide treatments which again nobody nobody really is but April is really a critical month and once we get to to mid-June here it's uh, yeah it's really difficult to do anything except just try to avoid them. Um, one thing I'll mention, I've, I've been seeing a lot of caterpillars in the field, uh, you know, during my field work the past couple of weeks. So there's a lot of, you know, most people have a good search image for brown tail. Um, now, you know, very distinct with those two orange or red spots on the, on the tail end. But, you know, there are still a lot of calls that come in uh, confusing brown tail with some of our other common caterpillars. So good ones to know. Um, you know, forest tent caterpillar. This is a pretty common. Oops. I'm getting a ton of feedback. Oh, um, forest tent caterpillar here. Um, this one also makes nests, uh, tents, but unlike brown tail moth, these will kind of be towards the interior of the tree versus the very tips of the uh, the branches, and they'll be quite a bit larger, and they're usually nestled in the uh, the, uh, the, the crotches of branches and stuff, but really common on fruit trees and the like, and that's that's where you mostly see them. So we get a lot of confusion of those uh, because they do both make those tents. Um, and then the non-tent making, so forest tent, despite the name, uh, does not make tents. But uh, yeah, we've been getting a couple of reports about these recently. Um, so yeah, blue lines, and then depending on what you want to call it, uh, bowling pins upside down, shoe prints in white, uh, penguins, uh, however you remember it easily. That's how you identify forest tent. That's one of the more distinct ones. So uh, be on the lookout for that, you know, and again, these these native ones really hardly ever do any damage. There's, you know, what, one example of, you know, forest tent uh, doing some significant damage in Blue Hill a couple of years ago here in Maine and elsewhere, like in Vermont, it's actually, you know, a pretty significant outbreaking pest, but uh, hasn't done much in Maine. But again, we've gotten some some reports of it this year. And then gypsy moth, which I fear is probably on it on the rise here in certain areas of Maine. Uh, that one's been around forever and a lot of people are probably familiar with that. So, you know, pairs of dark red spots on one end and pairs of uh, dark blue spots on the other. So, uh, but yeah, those are just good general caterpillars to know that, you know, do uh, do present some some possible pest problems um, at some point, but but not always. So. <clears throat> All right. So then, yeah, as a landowner, again, for for brown tail. So unfortunately, a lot of the calls we get, you know, have to do with large amounts of, of large mature trees that you just can't get to, uh, even if you were to hire somebody, you know, beyond the reach of their equipment and stuff like that. So, you know, be aware of that. Um, it's an unfortunate reality. Um, we just don't have, you know, great management methods yet. They're, they're doing a lot of research at the university and hopefully they'll come up with some new methods. Um, but for the time being, yeah, you know, it's kind of sticking with what's true and tried, winter web removal insecticide treatments on limited trees if it's possible and uh but another thing that we commonly encounter a lot of people think their oaks are dead as a doornail because all the leaves are gone and as as ghastly and horrible as it looks uh people should know that oaks are pretty well adapted to defoliation by other you know defoliators that existed and they've evolved with before brown tail so uh they should actually recover. You know, it's it's a little bit concerning how dry it is because drought uh, certainly does play a role. So if you have, you know, just a few trees or a tree in your lawn that's defoliated and you have the ability to give it some extra water, that is something you can do right now. But uh, without that drought in a normal year, um, basically trees should uh, refoliate um, in just a couple weeks here and do fine. So. Uh, again, if you're consulting with a forester, you know, and you have a significant oak component, knowing that brown tail is, you know, kind of here to stay, you can you can talk about some management. Or if you just have a few, um, you might want to go the removal route, uh, depending on what you want for your uh, your woodlot. But um, yeah, like I kind of mentioned, there's still a lot we're learning. You know, this pest is kind of you know it's been here for a long time, but it hasn't been. Uh, you know, this current outbreak is really unprecedented. So uh, yeah, we're, we're working on it. So stay up to date and we'll try to update you as best we can as, as often as possible. 
Um, story from last year I figured I'd throw in here. So, you know, just a reminder, we all heard of Asian longhorn beetle, probably another notorious pest that moves in firewood, but has been very quiet um, for several years. Um, the nearest infestation is in Worcester, Mass, that still exists here in the Northeast. And I'll show you a map with some others. But, uh, you know, just out of the blue here, this one popped up in uh, in South Carolina, you know, way disconnected from the other populations. And so just as a reminder to always be wary of this stuff because Maine um, certainly has abundant host habitat for Asian longhorn beetle because they do uh, they do like maples and uh, but they do have a white host range. So, so yeah, here's a uh, oops. Here's what the current national map looks like. So as you can see, these uh, these infestations are kind of spotty all over the place. Uh, there was uh, a population in Boston that's been eradicated. You know that Worcester uh, infestation is still active. They have good uh, eradication success with this, as you can see from all these green tickers, because uh, the habits of this particular beetle it tends to stay put more than some of our other invasives, but. Uh, you know, that's fortunate for control, but the big concern then is is people moving it. So you can see how disconnected these these different pockets are. And, you know, that's probably uh, part of the reason to do with it is this was accidentally moved. Uh, these guys are out flying right now. So that's why I bring this up. Uh, I saw one of these just yesterday on my own porch, but uh, this is our native white spotted pine sawyer. So get a good look at this. Uh, it obviously looks very similar to some of the uh, invasive longhorn beetles that we're concerned of. But um, yeah, if you're unsure, you know, this says do not report on this thing, but feel free to report if you're just not sure. But, you know, just be aware, we do have some native lookalikes. So uh, as you can see, you know, not quite that glossy color, more of a bronze, you know, instead of that jet black uh, glossy with that uh, high contrast. And, you know, these guys can have a little bit banding on the antennae. Um, occasionally, you can kind of see it, but it's not nearly as pronounced as as this in these two species here. That usually white, sometimes bluish. Uh, but yeah, um, again, if you're ever not sure and you have you capture something or get a picture of something, you can send it in. But uh, yeah, we we get a lot of these these miss uh, miss IDs, unfortunately. Here's what the damage looks like. So again, these guys really do like maples, uh, sugar maples in particular. So um, the females actually chew an ova position niche uh, where they lay their eggs. And like I said, they tend to reuse their hosts. So pretty large exit holes, you know, perfectly round, um, you know, bigger than the, the end of a pencil there. So if you see stuff like this, this is something to uh, to be concerned with and, and report for sure. And you can see, you know, just how much activity, multiple larvae, multiple adults emerging there um, where they've reused that host uh, constantly. All right, I'll launch into spruce budworm now. That's our next one that's uh, on my mind. So spruce budworm is a, uh, despite the name, balsam fir is really the preferred host. So if you have a lot of fur on your, your, um, your land and if, specifically if you live Further up north, uh, northern Maine, should be well aware of this guy right now. And it's it's a periodic pest that breaks outbreaks, you know, about every uh, 30 to 60 years in, in northeastern um, North America here in Maine. You know, it's usually about 40 years so uh, from our historical records. So the last great outbreak was in the uh, the mid 70s, the mid 80s. So we're we're totally due. Um, you know, it began as early as 1967 and, you know, really tailed out in 1993, but that core area there, and you can see just the massive range of, uh, you know, this is, this is truly, you know, a large scale pest and you know, that's a scene from, uh, the North Main woods there, but, um, yeah, just huge mortality of balsam fir, um, you know, affected 136 million acres over that entire region. And here in Maine, I think these rates are for Maine, you know, we had, you know, in certain areas, as high as 97% balsam fir mortality. And then when the balsam was dead, you know, spilling over onto spruce, a less preferred host, but a viable host, you know, as much as 66%. So, you know, that basically amounted to 20 to 25 million cores of, of mortality, you know, in terms of volume there. And then, you know, in financial firm uh, terms, hundreds of millions of, of dollars in lost uh, revenue to our forest industry that's obviously, you know, very important here in Maine. So there's a raging infestation going on in Quebec that we're keeping an eye on. And these guys, unfortunately, you know, are widely dispersed by, by the lower atmosphere. So they, 
you fly up and they, they basically ride the wind current so they can get blown anywhere over huge distances. So in, in 2019, we had these two unfortunate uh, dispersal events that really landed a lot of spruce budworm in northern Maine successfully, you know, alive and, and, and well. So uh, basically, <clears throat> those are the ones that we're dealing with now as they reproduce. So we maintain this really large pheromone trapping network uh, at, at its heyday, over 400 sites. Now it's about 350. So you can see, you know, this are color coded based on how many moths were intercepted in these uh, traps baited with pheromones. So very dramatic increase from 2018 to 2019. Um, and then again, you know, it, it looks like it decreased in, in, in 2019 uh, to 2020. These, you know, this is when these moths were actually flying in from Canada. So even though this looks like it's a lot less, you know, these moths, we didn't get those uh, huge immigration events from Canadian moths last year. So these ones that showed up in these traps are what we can consider, you know, native uh, spruce budworm moths to, to northern Maine there that, that completed their entire life cycle there. So, you know, that's, a, that's still a large population that's lingering. Um, yeah, for the first time since that last great outbreak, you know, in the, the early 90s when it really trickled out, you know, you can actually go out in north uh, northern Maine and find, you know, spruce budworm larvae. So we do quite a bit of defoliation surveying as we wait for that to look up. But uh, Yep, they're they're out there, and uh, there's there's certainly a lot of them around this year as well. Uh, we also do a lot of surveying uh, for another life stage. They overwinter as immature larvae as well, so we keep track of that. And you can see from 2019 to 2020, again, just elevated numbers of those larvae that we were finding um, in northern Maine. So yeah, this is a growing population that uh, that we're concerned about, and we're we're monitoring closely. Hemlock woolly delge, this is another regulated uh, pest here in Maine. I won't go into the life cycle because it's incredibly complex, but um, the important stage you need to know about probably is the crawlers. You can see them here with a penny for scale, just how microscopic they are. And these are the um, stage of this insect that's actually mobile. And so they're really mobile from mid-March to the end of July. So that's when we recommend that people avoid hemlock management and movement of hemlock materials at, at all costs. So uh, the important thing, like I said, that life cycle is crazy. So they can reproduce sexually in their native range, but here one of the life uh, stages doesn't exist. So they can actually reproduce asexually. And so all you need is one of these crawlers to hypothetically, you know, establish an entirely new population. So Here's what they look like as, as more mature insects. So these crawlers will find, you know, an appropriate needle and they'll insert their stylet or their mouth parts into the, the, the woody part where they'll feed on the plant uh, fluids for the remainder of their lives. And then they secrete this kind of waxy covering. This is why they're called woolly adelgid. They basically look like little tiny cotton balls. And uh, again, tiny, tiny insects, but when you get huge numbers on them, they can really deplete resources from, from hemlock trees. And uh, they certainly are able to, to kill trees over time. This is a regulated insect. So again, here's what the, uh, the regulated area looks like for Maine. So mostly the, you know, the coastal areas hasn't spread up when yet, because it is sensitive to winter temperatures, unlike some other ones. So it's, it's kind of been, you know, held to the coast, but Again, with climate change, we'll see what happens in the future there with it moving inland. So, so yeah, just know, you know, uh, really any materials, you know, especially during those, well, at all times of year. But, um, you know, don't within the regulated area, you really don't want to move stuff from that mid-March to, uh, to July period. And then, uh, yeah, nothing can actually leave this regulated area. So make sure you're not... Uh, you're not moving anything yourself, or if you know of you know any hemlock materials that are crossing these lines uh, accidentally, you know that's that's something that's good to report. Um, yeah, gypsy moth I alluded to as well. That's something you know we're kind of uh, concerned about is, is building in certain areas. Um, you know, it's really present uh, up until uh, 2019. This northern area in, in orange here was still not regulated because it was considered pretty much uh, gypsy moth free. But um, <clears throat> yeah, we found enough of it up here during our survey work in 2019 to, to change that. So all of Maine is regulated. And you can see here that basically that it's a federally regulated insect still as well. So 
uh, that federal quarantine zone is basically all of, of northeastern uh, U.S. all the way out to uh, to Minnesota and Wisconsin there. So, but yeah, where we've seen seen the most and gotten the most reports is all on that the the Route Two corridor. So if you live in that area, you know, be aware. Here's an example of you know new egg masses. So this is what you'll probably you know, be seeing plastered all over from from last year, but uh, the caterpillars you probably won't notice quite yet, but they'll be they'll be growing fast. And here's some old pupil cases and the like. So this is a uh, yeah one to look out for. And uh, it again, this one outbreaks on about a 10 year cycle, so we had a, an outbreak right around 2000, but then we seem to have skipped the one in 2010. So we're, we are due again, potentially, but for whatever reason, we just got lucky and, and missed one. Um, another fun one that's not in Maine yet, but to be on the, the lookout, this is spotted lanternfly. So this is uh, established in, you know, kind of the mid-Atlantic region, specifically Pennsylvania, kind of branching out. Um, can't see these little pink dots on this map, but they're they're all over, you know, uh, this map here. So those are all interceptions of uh, life stages that have hitchhiked or been transported. So like gypsy moth, the egg masses on these are, are really difficult to see potentially. They look kind of like cement and, uh, you know, these guys will even lay their eggs on anything. So certainly landscaping materials like, you know, raw building stone and concrete, you know, they'll, they'll lay egg masses on it. It's virtually invisible. But um, yeah, the uh, the insect itself is very charismatic and, and kind of you know once you know what it looks like, easy to determine uh, versus any of our our native stuff. So here's two of the nymphs, uh, the early nymphs, and then the the slightly more mature nymphs, and then there's the adult there, so bright red on their wings. But you know all this spotted coloration at certain times. So we have had these show up in Maine. Uh, we haven't found any of them living. Uh, there was a nursery shipment with some of these egg masses, and this is actually a photo taken uh, in Maine, uh, one of these uh, inspections of these trees that were out planted. So uh, horticulture is uh, going to keep uh, inspecting those out planting areas to make sure nothing's become established. But to my knowledge, yeah, they, they haven't found anything again here in 2021. But uh, uh, this one also has the host uh, one of its preferred host trees is Tree of Heaven, which is also an invasive species. And we don't have a lot of that here in Maine, but again, that's one that's established in Southern Maine and, and may continue to spread. So uh, we're kind of using that as, rather than removing it as a potential monitoring tool to know if spotted lanternfly shows up in Maine as well. So, but be on the lookout for that one. Um, yeah, this is just another fun story uh, about biocontrol. So, if you live in, you know, mid coast or, or below, you might know about winter moth. Um, you know, pest of uh, of oaks and 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 maples. I think they prefer Norway maples. But at any rate, um, you know, these have you know done a little bit of damage, but not much. More of a, a nuisance um, that I'm aware of. I don't think there's ever been any significant mortality from these. But uh, there's a parasitoid fly that attacks these that we've been. Uh, uh, releasing year after year and you can see here's all the locations where they've been released so uh, we have really good recoveries of these in emergence and they're doing a really good job of uh, controlling these populations um, so we'll continue to, to move those around and uh, basically yeah, if you ever come across one of these boxes in the woods that's full of uh, fly puparia and they'll uh, once, once they have to overwinter out there in the woods and then come spring, we'll open these cages up and let them emerge on their own. And then they'll uh, deposit their eggs where uh, winter moth is feeding and winter moth will actually ingest the eggs and then they'll complete their development inside them. So uh, yeah, just another neat example of, of biological control. So, all right, that's some of the big players here in Maine. i sorry I sped through a little bit that, but I know I'm over time. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll Take any questions. Um, one of them that uh, I get a lot of calls about is um, the same thing of EAB, but it turns out to be a tiger beetle. Oh, yeah. So that's, uh, you know, we, we do do a bit of uh, education on what the adult beetle looks like. And that's all the way at the beginning. But uh, yeah, EAB is a bright metallic green beetle. So once people know that, they, they do see those tiger beetles and tend to report them, but uh, they have very different behaviors. So you're not going to find EAB on the ground ever. Um, 
and then the reason people report them tiger beetles are incredibly fast and they never sit still so that's really all people see is that flash of green and they associate it with eab but um yeah they are they are obviously two distinct things but um they're no harm they're they're native and they're they're beneficial um are the wasps expected to overwinter and parasitize next year too or are you going to have to bring a whole bunch more in oh okay yeah for eab biocontrol yeah they that's the whole idea so part of the uh the formula for making these uh finding these suitable candidates is that they come from uh geographic regions with similar climates so in in northeastern asia there um they are actually you know pretty pretty much uh quite a similar climate to the northern north america so um they will yeah we have different success rates with different species so there's two species of spathius for example uh the first one they they introduced um spathius agrilli did not seem to survive in northern climates in, in the u.s so that one's only released south of the 40th parallel i believe now but this new species spathius, spathius galenae is actually from the russian far east um and so that's you know very well suited to colder climates so that's what we're hoping to become established in uh in northern climates like maine tetrasticus uh the, uh, the other larval parasitoid does quite well everywhere that we know that one's been the most successful and then uh yeah the egg parasitoid is really hard to monitor uh but it has been recovered successfully and, and become established but but that's the whole idea you know release probably for a couple of years until you can uh uh determine whether or not you have establishment and then once you have establishment you go to a new area and start releasing there and they'll perpetuate their population. Then you can get good coverage by releasing in multiple places. How many years do you think it would take before we have enough to really make a difference? Well, so that's, that's you know, that's an important thing to, to realize, you know, they're not, they're not going to eliminate the population. You can't have that biocontrol until you have a population of EAB because that's all they, attack um so you can't get them started ahead of time and uh they're basically a maintenance tool i mean what what we all think is going to happen and they're only able to start studying this in michigan you know now about 20 years later that they've gone through the whole process so what we'll probably see you know eab will continue to uh to spread in maine and once we lose the majority of the ash we'll get small ash back you know in the aftermath for us so to speak and these parasitoids are really effective uh, on those smaller trees. So the hope is, you know, that they'll they'll help, you know, conserve ash on the landscape. You know, whether or not we're ever going to have big, beautiful ash trees in the forest, you know, that's that's probably anybody's guess. You know, it might be similar to, you know, the elm and the chestnut story, where we we only see them as small trees, and when they get to a certain size, you know, they tend to become vulnerable to, uh, in this case, EAB or you know those other diseases for the other species so uh you know but by doing that hopefully you know we're continuing to uh to do research there might be some other you know management available and you know that just that just contributes to the overall population control if you get you know four or five techniques that that can do something to uh control eab you might be able to to, to take a good uh, chunk out of the population now, are any concerns of any concern to the forest industry? There are 37 states now, and it's Maine one of them. Uh, that's a good question. I we our shop does not deal with them. I don't. I'm not sure if anybody else might know on here. I don't believe they've been uh, detected in Maine, but I can't say that they haven't uh, confidently. But um, yeah, I mean. Certainly, I mean, that's another forest health issue. I think there's still a lot of, you know, research going on on that and what the true effect is that on, you know, leaf litter and, and the forest uh, for, you know, nutrient cycling and the likes. Uh, certainly it's affecting other areas, um, how similar those areas are to our forest here in Maine and whether the effects will be the same, you know, that probably remains to be seen. But uh, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's not something that I've, I've have a lot of personal experience or have done uh, a lot of you know, digging on. So I can't provide a great answer for that. 
Okay. Well, how do all these pests affect the value of timber on trees to sell? It's full loss and part of the tree has to be salvaged. And how does that work with not transporting infected timber if it needs to go from the site to the mill? Could could you repeat that, Terry? Sorry, you're kind of breaking up a little bit. Okay. Um, how do these pests affect the value of timber or trees to sell? Are they a total loss or can part of the tree, depending on the pest, be salvaged? And how is that a problem when you transport the timber if it needs to go from the site to the mill? Okay, yeah, so so for that, it depends on the, the species of tree and the species of pest. So I'll give you kind of two examples. Um, you know, like Asian longhorn beetle, for example, as you saw in those pictures, you know, that's something that actually, you know, utilizes the, the heartwood or the core of the tree. So, you know, that obviously a tree that's been attacked by um, Asian longhorn beetle is full of holes. So that certainly will affect, you know, timber value if it's being used for lumber. You know, it somewhat depends on the product. Something like emerald ash borer, um, it's not necessarily a total loss. Uh, that only affects the outer quarter inch of of wood at the best. So that stuff, that that infected material can actually be uh, removed um, to save some of that value. Uh, one of the bigger concerns is that, you know, when emerald ash borer starts to kill trees fast, we can't keep up with harvesting. So you do get, you know, timber degradation in the tree, you know, still standing in the forest before you cut it and, you know, it becomes brittle and and basically unusable and unsafe to cut and we see that with some other forest pests um but yeah as far as as far as moving you know these species that have forest pests associated with them so for example you know we do allow some ash logs to leave a regulated area but it's only during the period of time when emerald ash borer is not flying so we set hard boundaries on when those times are and all this movement happens under what's called a compliance agreement. And that compliance agreement has very specific terms about what has to be done. So, you know, usually any material, any log, you know, that's going, you know, an ash log that's going uh, to a mill outside the regulated area has to be 100% utilized by the next flight season. So before any emerald ash borer could ever have a chance to emerge again, you know, it'll be totally utilized. So that outer wood uh, would be removed. Again, that inner wood is, is considered safe once that bark is removed, but then there's also always terms, well, that waste material has to be destroyed, you know, in an approved way, you know, usually incineration. A lot of these um, mills have, you know, uh, ways to incinerate or use that for energy as well. So, so all that high risk material has to be, you know, utilized uh, in a certain way by a certain time to allow that to happen. And then, you know, wood chipping, for example, we just recently re uh, deregulated wood chips because uh, there wasn't really the evidence that we thought there was that that they could be potentially damaging. But for a long time there, wood chips all had to be chipped to a dimension. You know, if it was ash, for example, that it was less than one inch in two dimensions. And by, you know, that process happening, there was really no chance that any emerald ash borer larvae in a, a tree that was being chipped could survive. Um, and even if they survived the chipping uh, process would have a large enough piece of material in that chip pile to, to continue to live on. So, uh, so yeah, it is possible, you know, some stuff we, we do just, you know, not, not allow because there's no safe way to do it, but there are ways to work around uh, some of those, those issues. I'm kind of wondering if some of those might be um, popular woods at some point, like spalted maple. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I get a ton of questions, you know, from people from that are moving to Maine. Like I've had several this spring, you know, new people moving to Maine from Emerald Ash Borer. Um, you know, areas outside of the state where they have all this ash, you know, that's live edge with these beautiful galleries in it and they're looking to bring it to Maine. And, you know, that's something we don't allow. You know, I'm from New York originally. I have furniture like that, you know, after EAB was no longer regulated in that area, but I didn't bring it here. Um, so, yeah, you know, a lot of that, uh, there's a lot of niche markets, you know, um, blue stain fungus, you know, uh, in pine trees out west, you know, that's become you know, what used to be considered waste, that's become popular, all that discoloration in pine, uh, 
pine boards and stuff is is now something that's sought after and valuable. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, depends on depends on the eye of the the person utilizing or, or purchasing. You know, uh, some people see beauty where where they're you know other people's don't. Karen posted that uh, you main scientists discovered invasive earthworms in aroostook forest lands. Oh, okay. Well, um, yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I can't say I'm up to date with that. So, uh, but that's good to know. So, that was just an email, Mike, that came in my inbox today through an invasive species network uh, group that you maybe maybe not are on, but. Oh anyway. well, if it if it just happened today, then I don't feel that bad about not knowing it. But uh, there you go. <laughs> it was. Uh, yeah, that's, Kathy that's says common. those aren't Asian jumping worms, though. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's uh, there's been, you know, that is something, you know, like I said, our shop doesn't deal with that, but uh, more and more frequently, I guess we have had some some questions arising uh, surrounding the earthworm, uh, you know, situation, um, especially because some of the other stuff seen in New England. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure uh, who's really spearheading any any effort uh, on that here in Maine. If you go on main.gov, Kathy, and just put in Asian jumping worms, you'll probably find out if someone is actually looking for those. Okay, well, it looks like there are no other questions. Uh, thanks an awful lot, Mike. That was really interesting. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, that was a lot of material. So if anybody thinks of any follow-up questions, obviously feel free to uh, send them to Terry to pass along to me, or you can reach out to me. Uh, you have my contact information. So uh, yeah, thanks everyone for listening and uh, enjoy Aaron's talk. Take care. <laughs>